Well, Hope City, I am so happy to be back with you. You got to know during our time off, I was praying for you and I really missed being with you. And I'm just so thankful for every single one of you. I'm thankful for our church. Last Sunday, I was able to be at the opening for our new permanent home for our Terwilliger campus. And I got to tell you, that was so awesome. And yeah, give it up. It was so great. We're so excited. Shout out to all of you who are there and also to our Kingsway campus today. I just love seeing what God is doing across our church and I'm just looking forward to what God has in store for us in this season ahead. And in fact, I want to give you a sneak peek. We are launching a Thursday night service starting in October here at our Millwoods campus. So stay tuned for details on that. And it's just really good to be back with you. I'm curious, have you ever said this? I need to be more like Jesus. Time and time again, I walk through stuff and I don't necessarily respond the way I would like to and I conclude, I need to be more like Jesus. Anyone with me on this or am I alone? Yeah, (laughs) oh, you get claps. Yeah, I suck at following Jesus, yeah. (laughs) No, I get it, right? You know, on our holidays, I was driving down the 401 in Ontario and It's the busiest highway in the world. Google it, you'll see it. And the amount of crazy drivers I encountered was staggering. From those veering into my lane without realizing I'm right beside them, to those driving 160 kilometers an hour, weaving in and out of traffic, and to those driving 70 kilometers an hour in the passing lane. It was just nuts. And some of the thoughts and words coming to my mouth were not helpful, let's say. And at times like that, I'm just like, I need to be more like Jesus. In fact, on that highway, just a couple weeks ago, I did a first. No, I wasn't screaming or doing hand signals that, as your pastor, I should not be doing. I was driving 130 in the passing lane, and before you judge me, just know I was keeping up with traffic, okay? (laughs) And suddenly, the car I'm driving drops to 40 kilometers an hour. And I step on the gas pedal, and it's got zero give. And I got this stream of cars behind me. I look in the rearview mirror, and all you see is, they all just slow down. And I'm like, oh, boy. So I throw my hazards, and I pull over on the left shoulder. And the cars just continue to whiz by me. So there's the concrete um, barrier, and I'm driving down the left shoulder with traffic whizzing by me on the right, five lanes of traffic, okay? Okay. And here I am on the shoulder going 40 kilometers an hour, and I can't go any faster. I don't know what's up. So I turn the car off. I'm thinking maybe turning it on and off will help. And I start it again. It's the same thing. Can't go over 40. And here's where it gets tricky. I knew, like, I could die if I exit the car right there and try to cross the highway on foot. You don't leave your car there. So I knew I needed to get over to the right shoulder. But how do I cross five lanes of traffic on the 401 going 40 when everyone else is whizzing by? So I just prayed. I was like, Lord, I need a space here. And literally within 30 seconds, I saw my opportunity and I went for it. I veered into the five lanes. Going 30, going across. I was like, Jesus, take the wheel, right? (laughs) And obviously I made it. And thank you, Lord. And then, you know, I recognized there was an exit I could pull off, and I pulled into a small town. Long story short, I blew the engine on my parents' vehicle. And you can imagine at that point, my words weren't, thank you, Jesus. (laughs) See, I don't know about you, but I constantly recognize I need to be more like Jesus. I'm pretty sure you relate. It could be getting impatient in lineups, getting overly angry with your kids, It could be a whole bunch of things, but I suspect a lot of us would say, I just need to be more like Jesus. And that's what this series for the summer has been about, a series that has helped us understand how to look more like Jesus. And I just want to give a big shout out to our team of pastors who have communicated on the weeks I was away. I love our team of teachers and how God is working through every single one of them. And in this series, we've been looking at something Jesus spoke called the Beatitudes. Now, Beatitudes means blessings. He's giving practical advice to holistic living as a follower of him. And it's important to understand the context of which Jesus spoke these words. 
Because if we don't, they become either frustrating idealism, oppressive legalism, or complicated and unrealistic goals we're trying to achieve. Jesus speaks his beatitudes in the context of the gospel message. And the gospel just means good news. And the good news message is, just, is this, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus is declaring that in him and because of him, the long-awaited kingdom of God is breaking into the world. At that point in time, this is what all of humanity had been waiting for. And this is good news and means something good for us today as well. It's kind of like the Old Testament prophet Isaiah wrote. He said this, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. So the light for the world and of the world has come. Hope has arrived. And then Jesus couples this announcement of his kingdom coming to earth with a call to change our thinking. He uses this word, repent. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is here. And repent means to turn around, to think again, to look at things in a different light. The kingdom of God is at hand, so make a U-turn. Think differently than the world around you. And then he gives us the image of what that actually looks like. He speaks things that seem counterculture, things that characterize those who choose to be part of the kingdom. He gives us the Beatitudes. They describe what it's like to be transformed by him, to be, as the biblical writer John put it, born again from above. They reveal what it's like when God gets a hold of your life. There's this picture of what it means when we say, I need to be more like Jesus. And they really are downside up. The opposite of what we would gravitate towards or even think of. And so what did Jesus say? What are these beatitudes? Let's read them. And they're in the first book of the New Testament entitled Matthew. And Matthew was a follower, a disciple of Jesus. And this is what he records him saying. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, blessed here means more than just being happy. It means to be fully and wholly satisfied. It's a deep joy despite circumstances. And doesn't that sound inviting? Like, who doesn't want that? And so today I'm looking at the last beatitude that Jesus spoke. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And Hope City, this one, this one kind of stinks. You know why? Because it's hard. In fact, it's the only one of the beatitudes that Jesus speaks that receives extra treatment. So Jesus drops it, and then he repeats himself in the next verses. He says this, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Blessed are those who are persecuted. Did Jesus legitimately just say that? And I think he repeated it because he knew we're going to need to hear that line again. And I want you to notice something. Jesus shifts his language from third person, all the Beatitudes are spoken in third person, to direct address right now. He moves from they to you and he brings himself into the picture. And so blessed are those who are persecuted to blessed are you when people insult you persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Now the other seven beatitudes are things that God does inside of us as we follow Jesus. And for the most part, even though they are tough, we gravitate towards them. Like we welcome being pure in heart. We welcome growing in mercy or being poor in spirit. 
These are attributes that God forms inside of us upon making the best decision of our life, which is to follow him. But this final beatitude is one that others do to us in order for God to do his work inside of us. And that's different because, let's be honest, we don't like it when others tell us what to do or what, in their opinion, we are doing wrong or worse yet, as Jesus says, when they persecute or attack us. So Jesus puts the word persecute and blessing in the same sentence. And I almost wished he didn't. It's like having food and licorice in the same sentence. Or fun and museum. You get it. (laughs) See, this eighth and final beatitude acts as the culmination of the previous seven. After we repent and follow him, he works inside of us and the previous seven traits start to work in us and Jesus calls this righteousness, meaning living in alignment with God's will and moral principles. It's a pursuit of justice, love, truth, and holiness. In its simplest form, righteousness is the establishment of a right relationship, primarily between God and people, secondarily between people themselves. And it's really relevant in every area of life, in relationships between husband and wife, parents and children, fellow citizens, employer and employee, merchant and customers, God and people. As we become more like Jesus, as we become righteous, Jesus is saying there's a high chance you will be persecuted. You will be mocked for looking and acting like him not for something else. And I think sometimes we can get this a little messed up because notice what it's not. It's not persecution for being obnoxious or being tactless or insensitive in the way we live and speak about the good news of Jesus. It's not shoving the gospel down people's throats or being militant in our stand for biblical values. It's persecution for being righteous for looking and acting like Jesus. You know, right now, believers all over the world are experiencing persecution. David Barrett, he's the editor of the World Christian Encyclopedia. He says if we total up the number of Christians martyred for their faith in the 20th century, it works out, to check this out, to an average of 454,000 a year. It is estimated that over 200 million Christians in 60 countries are currently being denied basic human rights because of their allegiance to Jesus. A 2021 report indicates that there has been attacks on Christians in over 25 countries, all because of their belief and association with Jesus. This is real time, folks. It's happening in real places and people are losing their lives and living in hardship because of their commitment to Jesus. You know, in fact, I, I think it would be right for us to pause and pray for them right now. Because scripture tells us to pray for the body of Christ around the world. So Hope City, join me in praying for persecuted believers around the world. God, right now we just come before you in humility And we come before you and pray for our brothers and sisters who are facing hardship because of their allegiance to you. On this day, in this hour, Holy Spirit, come alongside of them and we pray for strength. We pray for endurance. We pray that they have the power to stand strong. Holy Spirit, surround them, equip them, empower them. We pray that they sense you, God, in and through every circumstance, in and through every situation. Give them the ability to stand strong, to not back down. Give them the ability to trust you and look to you. And so, God, I pray for hope inside of their hearts and lives. I pray for just a a, a strength and encouragement through your spirit in and through them today. I pray that you push back the forces of darkness and allow the forces of light to be stronger in their life and in their circumstance. And we pray this over and for them in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the what? The kingdom of of heaven. And what Jesus means here is that there will be a reward for those who endure at the final judgment of humanity. 
And check this out. Jesus starts the Beatitudes, his first one, with this promise, and he ends them with the same promise. Living like Jesus that ensures eternal life in heaven. You will receive a reward. Just like the prophets from of old, he said. You will receive something that cannot fade or rust. Those facing persecution for Jesus' sake will have an eternal reward. And then Jesus gives us examples of the persecution we can face. He talks about verbal abuse. He says the words, when people insult you. This actually happened to him when he was on the, well, it happened to him a lot, but it happened to him when he was on the cross from the crowd of people and even the two criminals next to him. Matthew, later on in his book, tells us that they too, the criminals, along with the religious leaders, heaped insults on him. Jesus also talks about defamation, when people say false things about you or talk evil against you. I don't know about you, but that riles me up. Falsely accused, right? And here's the thing, this is where it gets hard, because Jesus is saying, as you become more like him, as you look and act more like him, as you become righteous, persecution is not an if, but a when. It's not a maybe, but a guarantee. And that stinks, doesn't it? Because wouldn't it be so much easier to follow Jesus if we didn't have to endure this? And the Bible makes this fact pretty clear. There's a time when Jesus was commissioning the disciples to go out and proclaim the good news. And he says this to them, when you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. Notice the word, when. He also says this, and he who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who has found his life will lose it, and he who has lost his life for my sake will find it. The cost of following Jesus. The writer of Hebrews tells us, remember those earlier days after you had received the light when you endured in a great conflict full of suffering. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times, you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You were suffered along with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. Notice the reward language again. Peter, he's a follower of Jesus, a disciple. He was instrumental in starting the church. He wrote these words. Beloved, meaning, hey, church, do not be surprised at the fiery trial that has come upon you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice that you share in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed at the revelation of his glory. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed. Sounds like Jesus, right? Because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Indeed, none of you should suffer as a murderer or thief or wrongdoer or even a meddler. But if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but glorify God that you bear that name. That's not good marketing for following Jesus. That's not a great ad campaign to join the kingdom. Jesus clearly says, blessed are you who are persecuted on account of me. It's not an if, but a when. Living righteously will rub people the wrong way. And you will get slack for it. And here's the thing. Jesus didn't just say it, but he lived it. He didn't just expect it, he modeled it. So why are we persecuted? Because of righteousness. And Jesus experienced persecution by being righteous, doing righteousness, and speaking righteously. First, by being righteous. See, when righteousness is encountered by those who are unrighteous, it's either a blessing or a threat. That's because the presence of righteousness and goodness calls for change. It exposes injustice and corruption. And without speaking, the presence of righteousness exposes rottenness. And since Jesus was God incarnate, the light of the world, meaning no darkness was in him, his mere being in a place exposed attitudes and actions of darkness that at times would push back. You know, I remember doing some missions work in the country of Haiti. And I got to tell you, just being there felt different. 
right next to the compound where we were staying, there was a witch doctor who would get up early and chant threats over the compound. And this would wake us up every single day. And our global worker there told us this happens every single day. The mere presence of righteousness causes pushback in people. Why? Because it's a spiritual battle. Because it's counter-cultural. As a Christ follower, we're to be different than the world. Paul, a New Testament writer, uses language like we need to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. We need to be set apart other than different from. The writer of Hebrews says we are aliens and strangers in this world. Friends, Jesus is wonderfully different. He is not of this world, and his presence was a threat. And so Jesus was persecuted by being righteous, but also by doing righteousness. See, he disturbed the status quo. Doing righteousness in an unrighteous world always rocks the boat. It's a downside-up approach. Everything Jesus stands for and represents in his kingdom challenges everything in the kingdom of this world. He brought different values, different priorities, and the coming of his kingdom means a permanent confrontation of the world until he comes to make things right. His ways cause question marks in the established ideas and answers developed by people and societies. And so how did Jesus do righteousness? Well, he brought the wrong people to the parties. He ate with sinners. The religious establishment taught people had to shape up to come home, and all Jesus taught was people had to come home, and then the shaping up would occur later. He violated the meaning of the Sabbath. He didn't violate God's commandment. He just rocked what man had made it to be. He also rocked the boat by healing people and casting out demons. And at one time, this caused the whole town to say, nah, nah, Jesus, we don't want anything to do with you. You got to get out of here. When you act righteously in an unrighteous world, some cannot handle it. When people living in a certain pattern are confronted with a different pattern that contradicts their way, many want to retaliate or persecute because it's easier than to change. And deep down, that is a spiritual conflict, a spiritual tension. So Jesus was persecuted by being righteous, for doing righteousness, and thirdly, for speaking righteously. So he walked up to people that were considered less than, fishermen and tax collectors. And you know what he said? Follow me. I'm so grateful for that. He made claims about himself that enraged people. I'm the light of the world. I'm the door entered by me. I'm the vine. Apart from me, you can do nothing. I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. I'm the bread of life. Before Abraham was, I am. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And notice he doesn't say a way, a truth, but the way and the truth. There is only one way to God, and it's through Jesus. And people couldn't handle him talking this way, and so they crucified him. They had to do away with Jesus because of the righteousness that he spoke. But it wasn't just Jesus. There was a time after Jesus rose and ascended into heaven, two of his disciples, namely Peter and John, were going to the temple to pray one day, and they encountered a crippled beggar. He was asking for money, and Peter says this, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And so the man who's been crippled forever gets up and walks, and the city goes wild, right? Not really. This is where it gets kind of weird. Because the religious authorities call Peter in and say, how'd you do this? By what power or name did you do this? And look at what Peter says next. Know this, you and all the people of Israel. I love his boldness, okay? It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Check this out. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. 
Do you catch that? There is no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. That's what got Peter into trouble. The claim that life is found in Jesus and only in him. And in our pluralistic Canadian culture, it's common and politically correct to say Jesus can be one of many healers or one of many lords. Pluralism is what's really acceptable in our age of tolerance. In fact, just recently, I heard about this creed being recited in a church. It's a church where once the Apostles' Creed would traditionally have been recited. If you don't know what that is, Google it. And just listen to how it starts. I believe in the non-binary God whose pronouns are plural. I believe in Jesus Christ, their child, who wore a fabulous tunic. What? You see, speaking righteously is countercultural. Peter had the courage to declare that there is no other healer but Jesus, no other Lord but Jesus, no other name under heaven by which we can be saved but by Jesus himself. And that got him into trouble. And Christians who say this and believe this are accused of being intolerant. But Hope City, hear me out. This has nothing to do with intolerance. This has everything to do with righteousness. It has everything to do with faithfulness to relationship with Jesus. Listen, he made the claims. We didn't. We can't water them down. We can't give in to the spirit of the age or deny who he is. Of course, we must be kind. Of course, we got to be loving, respectful, meek, and gentle. But we cannot be unfaithful to who he claims to be. There is no other name under heaven that has been given to us by which we must be saved. And that name, friends, is Jesus. His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. And you got to know, at Hope City, we believe that. And it's good news. You are blessed when you are persecuted for the sake of righteousness. Blessed? Really? Yes, you are. Righteous living doesn't guarantee carefree living. It only guarantees a faithful reward. And I've kind of processed this, friends. Our goal isn't to be liked by all. Our goal is to be more like Jesus. And when we're more like Jesus, we will be treated more like Jesus was treated. We will look more like Jesus looked. It's why he said, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And so, Hope City, can I encourage you? Be righteous. Do righteousness. Speak righteously. That's how you will be more like Jesus. And let's be honest. Don't we all need to be more like Jesus? And so my prayer is simply this. For me and for you. Jesus, help me take up my cross and follow you. Jesus, help me realize that I may face persecution. Jesus, help me realize that at times the world's patterns and systems will be out of sync with your values and morals. But then, Jesus, help me to remember that it's okay because there is reward in heaven. Blessed are you who are persecuted because of righteousness, because of Jesus, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. I'm going to ask you to stand if you are able. I want to pray over you in closing. It's not a fun word. I knew that going into today. But as I prayed earlier for the persecuted church, I want you to know that I'm going to pray for you, church, now that you are able to live righteously in a world that questions righteousness. So let me pray over you. Jesus, I thank you so much for these amazing people, for their hearts, for their lives, for their desire to follow you and serve you. And God, I pray today for a confident boldness for a Holy Spirit-empowered assurance that whatever it is that they are walking through, Lord, I pray that they may not shrink back 
I pray that they follow you with heart, soul, strength, and mind in and through every circumstance, every situation, every trial, and everything you bring their way. I pray that they find themselves looking to you for everything, God. I ask that when there is tension, God, may they just look to you and say, I want to follow you. I want to live righteously. And so I pray that over and for them. May they be men and women of righteousness. May they speak righteously. May they do righteousness. May their presence in places just draw people to you, God. And so I ask today that there's a little bit of a hope placed inside of them. Not something that debtors them from following you, but a Holy Spirit spark and a fire that just says, yes, God, I can do this. I will do this. I want to do this. I will serve you. I will follow you with my heart, with my soul, with my mind, with all my strength. I give you all that I am, God, and I serve you. And because of that, I will walk with you. And so I pray that over them. I pray that for them. I pray that you encourage them this day. And God, I pray for that person who might be here who doesn't know you personally. And maybe that's you. Maybe you're joining us online, one of our campuses, or you're just here in person, you're saying, yeah, I've never really made the decision to follow Jesus, or he did, it was long ago, and you're just like, man, I'm back in church. I am so glad that you are here with us today. I'm so glad that you're engaging with our church. But listen to me, there's one way to God, it's through Jesus Christ, you heard me say it, and he loves you, he died for you, he went to the cross to forgive your sins, he rose, and he offers you life, both now and forevermore. And all you need to do is say, I profess my belief in him. And so if that's you today, I'm going to pray a prayer that just helps you put into words what it means to follow Jesus. Let's pray. God, today I see my need for you, and I ask you to come into my heart, into my life. I believe that you are Jesus, the Son of God who came to die and forgive my sins on the cross, that you rose to offer me life both now and forevermore. And so today I want to make you Lord and leader of my life. I want to follow you, and I want to commit my life to you, and I want to understand what it means to truly live a life of righteousness. And God, I pray for every individual, for every couple, and for every family. As they go into this week, I pray that they sense you around them, ahead of them, and behind them. I pray that they know, God, that you are for them. And that nothing that comes their way is impossible for them to face when they have the almighty, all-powerful God holding their hand, walking with them. I pray that they are empowered by your Holy Spirit. I pray that they are equipped from above to walk as righteous men and women, giving glory and honor and praise to you in and through all things with every circumstance. And I pray this over and for them in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. If you prayed the prayer of surrendering your life to Christ, can I ask you to scan the QR code on the screen or the seat back in front of you? It just helps us get in contact with you, and you got to tell someone this great news, and it helps us walk with you, and um, just helps you take some next steps in knowing and following Jesus. Hope City know this. Love you guys tons. I believe in you. I believe that you can live this life amazingly. So let God work in and through you this week. Let his Holy Spirit empower and equip you. Live righteously and change the world. Thank you for being in church today. God bless you guys. If you made the decision to follow Jesus today or you're wanting to explore what it means to follow him, we're so excited for you and we want to help. Go to hopecity.ca slash life and there you can find resources to help you get started as well as a place to reach out if you wanted to connect with a pastor. Following Jesus is not something that we're meant to do alone. So let us help you get connected with Jesus and with other people who can join you on that journey. Thanks again for taking time out of your weekend to be with us, and we hope you have a great rest of your week.